Wonderful. So we're the, the last session between you and lunch. <laughs> so a lot, of, a lot of pressure to, to at least try to stay on time. So thanks everybody for attending uh, in person. It's a great turnout and for those online. Um, so our session's called Building a Global Regulatory Vision for Product in Drug Development, Some of the Challenges and Opportunities. So we're going to shift from a very U.S.-centric focused discussion, which was really quite interesting. And as a citizen of the U.S., I'm quite interested in what was said. But, you know, there's about 7.5 billion other people on the planet. And so this session will at least touch a little bit on what's happening with them. So we're going to talk about a variety of issues and some of the global challenges, getting access to quality medications. We're going to talk about harmonization, regulatory agency assessments, reliance, and then low-cost, high-quality manufacturing, and then touch a little bit on clinical trials, and a lot of that's already been said, but I think we can add a little bit to what's been said. Um, so there was a slide up that showed uh, a treatment uh, facility in, in Africa. And for those of you who are online and those of you who have access to it here, we put a couple of links in the clinical, or in the, the session here. And this is, this is one of those. And I just want to say a little bit, and uh, Rob, Rob touched on this a little bit earlier about like deaths from different diseases in the U.S., but if you Every year, 1.6 million Africans die of treatable malaria, TB, and HIV. So that's every year. So we've lost 1.1 million people to COVID over the last several years. Uh, and when you think about who's dying, a lot of these are children, typically under the age of five. Um, so, so that's why I think our session is so important. Only 2% of the drugs consumed in Africa are actually made in Africa, and many sick patients don't even have access to drugs or may not be able to afford those. We talked about affordability, or you heard about affordability in the last uh, session. Uh, but to give in Uganda, to give a child malaria treatment, uh, it typically costs a household about 11 days of income. So you can imagine if you have several children, uh, they get malaria a couple times during the malaria season, what that does to your income. So by way of introduction, uh, my name is Dan Hartman. I'm the Director of Integrated Development at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I've been there about 11 years. Um, and before that, I worked at various pharma and biotech companies. Uh, in my current role, my team at Integrated Development provides technical input on manufacturing, regulatory, quantitative sciences, all the PKPD work, to statistics, to uh, the four-letter word WRE, real-world evidence, uh, <laughs> that we heard in the last sec session, uh, on a portfolio of about $1.5 billion per year. Um, so I worked in, um, I've been doing this for about 25 years. I'm a pulmonologist by training. Um, and I am joined by a fantastic panel, and it's great to see everybody here ca calling in from all over the world, literally. Uh, but I'm going to hand it over to Kathy to introduce herself, and then I will introduce our panelists uh, alphabetically. Okay, great. Thank you, Dan. Yes, I'm, I think everybody heard me who was here today. I'm Kathy Giacomini. I'm co-PI of the UCSF Stanford Circe. I'm also dean of the UCSF School of Pharmacy. So wearing both hats, we're very interested in global regulatory sciences. We're interested in global pharmacy, and we're interested in global, global harmonization, if you will, of sciences and regulatory science research. So, Dan. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, Professor Moji. Thank you very much, uh, Dan and uh, Kathy, uh, and all the other panelists uh, for being part of this uh, unique uh, uh, audience or panel. I'm Moji Adeyeye. I'm the Director General of uh, NAVDAC, which is FDA equivalent in Nigeria. Uh, I was in the US for 37 years as a professor for 30 years before going back to Nigeria to head uh, NAVDAC. And I just finished my first term, uh, my second term, or five years, started December 1. I'm very, very happy to be here. Thank you so much. Great, thank, thank you, and congratulations on your second term. 
Uh, Emer, could you introduce yourself, please? Good afternoon or good morning. I'm not quite sure where we are. It's actually evening here in Amsterdam. Um, I'm Emer Cook. I'm the executive director of the European Medicines Agency uh, in Amsterdam, uh, Netherlands. I took over as executive director um, just over two years ago, a couple of weeks after the first successful vaccine trials, uh, COVID vaccine trials were completed. Um, and we authorized uh, the first vaccines in, in December 2020. So I've had a, a, a very eventful two and a half years as, um, as uh, executive director of, of uh, the European Medicines Agency. Immediately prior to um, coming here to Amsterdam, I uh, spent four years in Geneva in charge of the uh, regulatory activities at the World Health Organization. So I did a lot of work there on, uh, with the Gates Foundation, in fact, um, on global uh, harmonization. But I've actually worked in international collaboration activities since 1992. I'm absolutely passionate about getting us to do things better together as an international community. I worked in ICH. I'm now chair of the International Coalition of Medicines Regulatory Authorities. I'll talk about that during my, my talk today. And uh, yeah, I'm very excited about being here. Thank you. Great. Th thanks, Emer. You checked multiple boxes for our panel today. <laughs> uh, Frank. Thanks, Dan. I appreciate the opportunity to come and talk to you today about uh, the work that we're doing. Uh, I'm uh, chair of the Chemical and Life Science Engineering Department at VCU. I also have a joint appointment with the Chemistry Department. I'm an organic chemist, and I'm also the CEO of the uh, Medicines for All Institute at VCU. Uh, I also helped start uh, a an effort with the federal government to try and re-onshore manufacturing of active pharmaceutical ingredients back in the United States in 2020. Uh, prior to that, I, I had actually retired from uh, Beringer Ingelheim Pharmaceuticals as head of North American Process Development. And my wife affectionately refers to me as the guy who failed retirement miserably. So uh, that's pretty much what I've been doing, and we've been working heavily with the Gates Foundation in, in this space of, uh, at the Medicines for All Institute. Great. Thank you, Frank. Uh, Peter. Hi, I'm Peter Marks, uh, Director of Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research at FDA. Um, I'm a hematologist oncologist by training. I uh, have worked uh, in academic medicine and industry. I've been at FDA for oh, a little over a decade, um, uh, first as Deputy Center Director and for the past uh, about six years as uh, Center Director. Um, and we have been involved in a fair amount of pandemic response over the past uh, three years and also uh, international collaboration uh, in, in that response. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Peter. And, and Jacques. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Yes. It should, it should work now. Jacques Mascaro, I am the head of uh, regulatory science and strategy at AstraZeneca. I'm also responsible for all the uh, shared regulatory functions uh, across the organization. I'm a pharmacist and biologist by training. I have several decades of experience in the industry. Before AstraZeneca, I worked for GNJ and for Roche. Um, I've been working mainly in R&D, in other uh, positions as well, but what I really enjoy is that I had a chance to work across many countries. So you have seen the international uh, approach uh, to what we do in, in R&D and developing and placing drugs on the market. I'm currently based in the United States and uh, thank you very much for this invitation. I'm very excited to participate in this session. Great, thank you. Great. Okay, great. That that was a great introduction from everybody, and uh, we're ready to take the first question on. I just want to encourage everyone to write your questions down. We'll, ha we'll try our best to make time for uh, questions from the audience, and I also would like to encourage the virtual audience to please enter your questions into Slido. Um, so this one is uh, in one minute. If you could change something to accelerate the development, approval, and access of safe and effective quality therapeutic medicines and vaccines in low and middle income countries, what would you do? 
So everybody, I've got a little timer here. Everyone gets a minute here, so I'm starting it. Okay, Dan, I'll start with you. All right, well, thanks. So, so I hope what we're gonna do during this session is articulate what some of these changes might be. So my list is gonna start with running the right clinical trials, uh, having efficient and predictive regulatory and policy bodies that would skillfully review the data and make a decision in a reasonable amount of time uh, about eight years ago, my group published uh, a retrospective review of how long it was taking products to get through the regulatory systems in low and middle income countries. And the unfortunate answer was four to seven years. Uh, I'm pleased to say that it's much better than that today. And then on the policy side, and, and Mark McClellan touched on this a little bit before, you know, once it goes through the regulatory process, how do these get um, recommended? And then finally, because these areas are so cost sensitive to have cost effective solutions that will make them accessible. Very good, well, one minute and three seconds, so not bad. Okay, uh, Frank, you're next. Uh, thanks, Kathy. Uh, I'm gonna focus on the latter about, about access because when you start thinking about uh, what's the worst case scenario that could happen with drug de development and bringing a product to the marketplace is that you spend hundreds of millions of dollars investing in the development of a drug and then you don't get uptake in the marketplace. And access then becomes a real key component to that. And so from my perspective, the thing that I would look at most is looking at how we can drive the cost down to these drugs and these for these low and middle income applications because these molecules are very complicated. And that's where a lot of the cost is. And so if we can actually spend some time up front developing methodologies to manufacture these drugs more cost effectively, then we cannot, once, once we get to a point where we have these drugs available in the marketplace, that they're affordable for everyone. Okay, great. Thank you, Frank. Okay, I'll go to Moji. Thank you very much. Uh, my elevator speech will be strengthening of a regulatory system uh, in compliance with World Health Assembly Resolution 47.20 of 2014, uh, in order to build the capacity of member states with the ultimate goal to have quality uh, access to quality medicines to different countries in low middle income countries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. We, I hope later on we can talk about how we might do that strengthening. Um, yes. Okay, next. How about uh, Peter? Yeah, thanks. I I think we could probably try to develop a framework with high income countries uh, to uh, try at least for certain products that are global uh, health priorities uh, to try to have uh, essentially uh, a commonality in how we go about our approvals, our files, so that um, low and middle income countries could uh, more easily uh, reference what we do. We have that uh, with WHO. Um, but I think we could probably do it on a broader uh, basis for a larger uh, swath of products, uh, including those in the cell and gene therapy space, uh, which are currently uh, essentially somewhat out of reach uh, for regulation in uh, any number of countries. Great. Thank you, Peter. Um, how about um, Emer? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so what I would do, I would really like to see, that, uh, see us improve integration and understanding across the various points in the medicines life cycle and ecosystems. So that there was perfect harmony across developers, regulators, funders and payers. I always get frustrated because I think we can do a lot from a regulatory perspective and we can influence a lot from a, a regulatory perspective to try and improve collaboration, but that's only on the development review and approval side. Um, but we, this doesn't mean that the products actually reach the patients in low and middle, middle income countries. And if I, I'll give you an example, um, during COVID, we built a process called the European Open Initiative, which enabled speedy regulatory reviews in over 160 low and middle income countries, but it didn't lead to access to the vaccines. And in my view, this is really an integrated systems failure. We need to think about how we get more collective thinking across stakeholders and to understand that some of the drivers might be political, they might be finance driven. Um, so I think we have to think outside. For me, I, I, I have a regulatory box, but we need to think, think across these boxes 
And if I had a magic wand, I would make this happen. Okay, thank you, Emer. So we heard a lot. We heard help clinical trials or improve clinical trials, increase access, improve regulatory systems, um, and then harmonize and integrate. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I forgot Jocks. So sorry, Jocks. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Kathy. No problem. Uh, I try to do it in a minute. Um, two things from, from my perspective. If we want to address the complexity of drug development, the complexity of populations, the first thing is about collaboration. And what I'm thinking about is collaboration at the sponsor level and collaboration at agencies level. And maybe we can discuss this a little bit uh, further uh, during the session. The second element is how do we simplify things and what can we do to simplify things? There is something that I believe we are not using enough, which is the use of technology. I think that if we focus on technology and data exchange in particular, I think that this can help us to address this question. Thank you very much, Charles. Okay, I will now turn it over to Dan to ask the second question. Great, Thank, thanks, Kathy. So I'm going to address this, uh, the first part of the question to Emer. So as you think about the important roles that regulatory agencies have in accelerating access to important medical interventions, could you comment on some of these pathways, as well as touching on how the maturity level of different regulatory agencies are assessed using a tool that was developed in part while you were at WHO? Yeah. So um, let me just start with the WHO Global Benchmarking Tool. Um, this is the only truly global tool for the evaluation of regulatory systems. Um, and it, it, it is really coming to its own now with uh, a number of uh, countries reaching what is called maturity level three, which shows they have a stable um, uh, and, and effective regulatory system. And I really just want to applaud NAFTAC as one of the recent um, uh, authorities who did achieve um, maturity level uh, uh, three. And one of the things that this uh, benchmarking tool does is, is allows you to be confident that uh, regulators with, with this maturity level, uh, that you can rely on the work that they do as well, because you know that it meets international standards. Now, there are another, a number of other um, ben, uh, benchmarking tools in existence, and we've been using them in Europe also for quite a long time, such as the this benchmarking of the European agencies, BEMA tool. We've also got the GMP. Um, uh, we've, we use tools developed by the uh, PICS, the Pharmaceutical Inspection Cooperation Scheme, and we've also had tools in the context of mutual recognition agreements. And these have served us very well, again, because they, they apply, make sure that you have the same standards in terms of regulatory approaches. So it means you can rely and trust your partners. So, um, but I think there's also a number of other things that we can use that are they're also very important. So in combination um, with the uh, benchmarking tools and the recognition of maturity level, um, there are also a number of collaborative review tools that we can use. Uh, we have a provision in our legislation in Europe that allows us to give an opinion uh, for to give a scientific opinion, the same sort of scientific opinion we would give for European citizens, we can give for any for countries across the world. We do this in collaboration with WHO. We involve regulators uh, from other countries in in the the um, uh, in the regulatory uh, process, and it means that we can evaluate something that maybe isn't so so much used on our territory, but is very very useful in in other countries such as malaria, HIV, TB, etc. And we're seeing a, a, a development of a number of other um, access. Uh, or collaborative tools such as um, Orbis, Access, um, even if they're not so much focused on low middle income approvals. Um, I think 
all of the work uh, helps us learn what works in in what particular uh, context they work. So some of them will work better in a high income area and some will work better in the low, low middle income approvals. I think the other area that I think we need to build on as well is the training of regulators. Uh, again, this is something we've been doing for as long as I can, uh, uh, can remember, but it really helps um, make sure that we can build the regulatory systems as, as Professor Modi said earlier on. Thank you. Great. Thank, thanks for that, Emer. Yeah, there's, I, I think it's important that we have a toolbox as opposed to a tool when it comes to some of, some of these different, different areas. And Professor Moji, in the Nigeria Regulatory Agency, uh, NAFDEC, uh, you recently uh, received the Maturity Level 3 designation. Can you just comment how you use the Global Benchmark Tool, as well as the importance of achieving uh, Maturity Level 3 and what that means for Nigeria? Thank you very much, uh, Dan. Uh, I would like to use uh, FDA, uh, US FDA, as a reference. Uh, we'll categorize US FDA as a maturity level four. Uh, now let's look at maturities level one, two, three, four. Uh, NAVDAC just got maturity level three. Uh, you cannot get maturity level three without taking care of all the indicators uh, under one and two. You cannot get maturity level four without taking care of all the indicators in one, two, and three. So there is no 95% uh, or 99% in terms of WHO global benchmarking, which is a very neat and very arduous uh, thing about uh, the benchmarking. Very good. Uh, essentially, for us in NAVDAC, uh, what the GBT uh, or global benchmarking tool uh, help us to do is to identify the weaknesses and strengths in licensing of our products, in the manufacturers and distributors' compliance, uh, in how effective is our post-marketing surveillance, uh, are we doing containment of market control in terms of illicit trade, uh, are we doing well in terms of regulatory inspection, uh, global, excuse me, good manufacturing practice compliance, uh, manufacturers are daring to that. How good is our laboratory testing? In low middle income countries, laboratory testing, it, it is. Uh, unlike FDA, where a lot of products are not tested because the system works. Uh, in low middle income countries, we have to test uh, because of potential uh, propensity for substandard falsified medicines. Uh, what does it require to get an NRA to get to maturity level three, which is the minimum actually, uh, in terms of well-functioning and stable regulatory system. Commitment from top management. I took over from, as a DG NAVDAC, uh, 2017 November, and uh, right from the beginning, my experience in the US, uh, in terms of quality management system, kicked in uh, in, in a very timely manner. So we committed to top manage, uh, we committed to uh, global benchmarking uh, using quality management system as a baseline. Uh, of course, we needed funding. Uh, unfortunately, I inherited a lot of debt, uh, but uh, I had to pay all the debt uh, in order to make sure that we are going to become stable. Uh, we, we are backed by legislation, by legislative framework. Uh, we have three acts uh, that uh, support our regulatory activities. Uh, Another question that uh, global benchmarking will ask is, um, how many staff do you have? Do you have enough staff uh, to fulfill the demands? And I mentioned quality management system as extremely important. Uh, in terms of uh, how we got to where we are, we were bench benchmarked uh, on seven functions, uh, plus licensing establishment, which is not uh, under our own jurisdiction, is under the Pharmacy Council of Nigeria. So both agencies were uh, benchmarked together. And uh, like I mentioned, uh, we had two, 268 indicators and over 860 recommendations uh, that we needed to make, uh, to, to meet rather, 
Uh, the 268 uh, recommendations were distributed over maturities levels one, two, three, four. Uh, and uh, we were able to meet maturity level three by October 2015, but we were declared uh, as a maturity level three agency March of 2020. Our next goal is to go to maturity level four. Some of the standards or indicators we've already met, uh, so it's not going to be too difficult, I believe so. Uh, we are working right now, we, we already set our target uh, for maturity level four. And then there is what is called the word listed authority, where it is almost like a specialized uh, uh, grouping. And uh, part of maturity level four indicators also apply to word listed authority. So we are working uh, for both uh, in order to make sure that our system is well established, as stable, and a well functioning uh, regulatory agency. There's a lot of reliance that is requested or required rather for different regulatory agencies in the world. And uh, the reliance you know, is among the different functions that I mentioned from regulatory inspection to lab testing, to clinical trials, uh, to mar mar market authorization, to vigilance, uh, to market control, and of course, to licensing establishment. So there is a lot of reliance within uh, the different uh, functions, and then there has to be reliance between agencies. Great. For, the, for, for, for reliance, we have to collaborate, identify weak links, uh, mentor other NMRAs, NAVDAC is doing that, uh, right now in terms of traceability and even a global benchmarking uh, tool. Reliance is also facilitated in the, you know, within our West African region and between regions. Uganda came to us, uh, Sapra down in the south also, uh, we've been interacting on different aspects of our regulatory activities. Uh, reliance promotes good regulatory practices, which is the focus. Uh, it helps build trust among NRAs and allow weak NRAs to you know, seize the opportunity to strengthen themselves. And of course, it facilitates sharing of resources, which is very important in low middle income countries. Uh, so with that, I'm going, and also in terms of affordability uh, for LM, L, LMICs countries, it is extremely important to strengthen the regulatory system. Yeah. And local manufacturing, it is. Uh, access is local manufacturing, but can, there cannot be local manufacturing without a strong regulatory uh, system. And uh, as far as NAVDAC is concerned, we use a lot of tools to ensure that our products, our products are more affordable, uh, quality products using uh, different uh, GMP inspection, like I mentioned, detection devices to ensure that we don't have uh, infiltration in this supply chain. Uh, using enforcement, we work with Interpol, uh, with FBI, uh, of course, using vigilance within the country, outside the country. And uh, NAVDAC is uh, known now for traceability, using traceability track and trace, uh, GS1 standard to monitor falsified medicines. We've used that for vaccines during the pandemic. And of course, uh, African Medicine Agency that is coming up, uh, that will also help us in terms of uh, affordability and accessibility. And the African Free Trade Agreement uh, will also make sure that uh, free trade based on quality of products and also based on maturity levels uh, will right. play very, very well. Thank you so much. Great. Thank, thank, you. thank you. And for, for the audience, I, I'm assuming most of you don't know, and Professor Moji talked about reliance. Uh, currently, only 10% of the countries in Africa are at maturity level three or, or a fully competent. So there, there's a key role in terms of how those countries are anchoring the other countries. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna move on to a question for uh, Jacques and Peter. Uh, so what are some of the key issues being addressed by the International Conference of Harmonization or other regulatory focus convenings and how will addressing some of these issues affect drug development and approval in low and middle income countries? So Jacques, why don't we go with you first since you've been last okay. every time here. <laughs> okay, so uh, let me start by saying that ICH has been and continues to be a success story over three decades. And uh, you know, 
across many continents, people have been involved. So it's really a global organization. And ICH has delivered on its harmonization efforts. And so ICH can help address some of the issues linked to the non-implementation of international standards by sponsors, by agencies across the world. And we have to take into account that, unfortunately, scientific development, execution of clinical trials, we had the issue of inclusion and diversity discussed earlier, but also assessment of data and even access to medicines. I'm thinking about in the design of clinical trials, access to standards of care. This is not equal across all countries. But on the other side, at the same time, ICH integrates the latest regulatory science standards. And I think that this can serve global medical needs. So my first point is that with ICH, in order to address these questions, we have a formidable harmonization toolbox that we can use. In 2015, when ICH restructured and bring many more members, observers, experts, I think ICH became a motor, an engine for convergence of regulatory standards between countries, agencies, sponsor, and what I feel is really important here, there is a huge alignment potential. And I think that this impact of the uh, 2015 reorganization is big. It clearly drives a global implementation, but also adherence to internationally recognized standards. The question remains whether authorities and sponsors are truly implementing and, and following ICH standards. I go back to what Emma mentioned with the uh, global benchmarking tool. I think that this uh, assessment uh, of national agencies' regulatory system is a good way forward. I think this would be my third point about what, how can ICH address this question. It's the interface between this global benchmarking tool and how ICH can contribute to the proper interpretation, number one, and number two, implementation of these standards. But I also believe that this can play an additional role. And I mentioned in my one minute introduction, the issue of, of collaboration and, and convergence. I think that convergence of regulatory decision making is an important one. There was the example given by um, Emmer of how EMA is doing the evaluation for other countries. Orbis is another one. We discussed access as well. I think that going in this direction and maybe including more low and medium income countries is a solution. I think the other aspect that I also address in my one minute is technology and data exchange. Uh, ICH is working on, on data exchange standards. I'm thinking about HL7, the Health Level 7, which is a non-for-profit organization uh, working on fire, on fast healthcare interoperable resources. I think that this is a way to facilitate exchange between regulatory agencies and also facilitate convergence. There is another example, which is the uh, Accumulus Synergy Consortium, which is looking into simplification of data exchange as well between sponsors and regulatory agencies. And I think that uh, these aspects can really help through the ICH development to address the question that we are facing on implementation and interpretation of standards across all countries in the world. Great, Thank, thanks for that. Um, Peter, thoughts? Yeah, so I, I'm not going to go back over uh, uh, ICH. I do think there are, uh, we kind of was touched on here, I think there are a variety of uh, collaborations uh, that we can use to try to, uh, again, find ways um, uh, to streamline uh, things in a, way, in a manner similar to what is Project Orbis, this concept that um, regulators can collaborate on file review um, uh, and uh, hopefully have more harmonization on what we require for various files. I think, again, I, I have a particular focus 
on rare disease treatments because I think that what we are seeing is an innovation killer, which is that um, uh, each uh, of our countries that have a small number of people with rare diseases, handfuls or a dozen or two dozen, um, don't reap the benefits of these advanced therapies because the market is, is not there um, uh, for any given uh, country, whereas globally you'd have a market for something. And if we could come to more harmonization, I think we would be in a better place. Obviously, someone is going to immediately say, well, how are you going to pay for it in various low and middle income countries? I think that is something that has to be thought about. Um, but I, I think that the, the regulatory uh, barriers um, are, are, are serving as an issue. So I think some of this work uh, is it, it, it comes back to uh, the uh, International Coalition of Medicines Regulatory Agent, uh, Authorities, which uh, Emer obviously uh, is, is, is the head of, uh, chair of right now. So um, I think this is uh, a, a place where some of that work could uh, take place. Great, thanks. Yeah, there's, there's lot, lots of opportunities there, and, and I appreciate you all for pointing out what some of those opportunities are, some of which are actually being realized. Um, to Frank, I'm going to move on to you, and you know, we've touched on affordability uh, quite a bit, and Frank and I met probably nine years ago. And Frank's a really smart chemist, and I'm just a pulmonologist. And he was <laughs> describing a bunch of things to me, and and it sounded really good, but I, I wasn't really sure. So when I hired my head of CMC, the first person I had them talk to was Frank, and and confirmed that Frank actually was a really smart guy and on the right track. Um, so so Frank, can you just talk to us a little bit about what you're doing at Medicines for All, uh, and 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 some of your other enterprises as it relates to making products affordable. Thanks, Dan. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to work with you over the last nine years. Uh, when we started uh, on this journey with uh, the Gates Foundation, the initial focus was on AIDS drugs, HIV drugs. And um, I was fortunate because uh, the last thing that I had done when I was at Bering Ringelheim was to develop a process for an HIV drug, Nevirapine. And at the time, it was a very high-volume drug. And Dan said, well, what could you do to reduce the cost of that drug? And so uh, they gave us funds to do that. And, and we were able to make a significant reduction in the cost. And so he gave us a series of other uh, test cases. And we were able to reduce the cost on those, too. And it was about reinventing the chemistry in a way that would take advantage of new technologies, because these were relatively old drugs. And so, uh, and they hadn't been looked at in a while. And so in each one of the cases, we were able to make a significant reduction that gave, uh, what we feel like gave the Gates Foundation a real uh, adequate return on their investment in us. And then um, uh, they asked us, so we went through all the first line therapies for HIV, and we've been able to uh, make a, a new technology and chemistry de uh, development activities with, with uh, each one of those cases. But the other thing that's interesting about this is that one of the challenges that we've got right now is that we're not using 21st century technology to make drugs. We're not even using probably 20th century technology to, drugs, to make drugs. We're using 19th century technology, basically batch manufacturing that's been used since the onset of the pharmaceutical industry. And it's the only case, I think, in the in, uh, our uh, gross domestic product, where a major sec sector of the uh, of the of that uh, uh, GDP is not using automation and continuous uh, uh, assembly line uh, strategies. So, what's different about what we're doing is we've got chemists and chemical engineers cohabitating to not only develop great new chemistry, but to develop new manufacturing platforms to produce some more cost effectively with lower labor costs. So that's how we got started. So uh, then Dan asked us to start looking at TB and malaria. And I said, well, you know, I'm just one guy, and we're going to need more people to do that. And he said, well, what if we gave you enough money to build an institute at VCU? And so uh, uh, we've been doing that for the last few years. And to kind of give you an example of what we've been able to accomplish, uh, the Gates Foundation has been really working actively on new TB medications for these resistant strands of TB. And uh, these are very complicated molecules. And there was a real concern that we'd be able to 
make market penetration because of the cost of the drugs. We were able to reduce the cost of that regimen about 65%. And that's going to get, allow us to be able to have a much higher success, probability for success in getting these things implemented in the marketplace. And then COVID hit. And uh, the university said, if you're not working on a COVID-related project, we're going to shut, uh, we have to shut down your lab. So I called Dan and his colleagues, and I said, look, I said, I got about 40 people standing around here. Uh, have you got any COVID-related projects for us to work on? And so uh, he gave us remdesivir and then molnupiravir. And right now, we're working on uh, numetrelivir with Pfizer in collaboration with them on that. And we'll, I'll give you an example of the impact that we could do. The, the, the launch process that Merck has for molnupiravir, the raw material cost is about $5,000 a kilo. We cut it to 200. And this is the kind of thing that can be done if you take time and look at these, revisit the chemistry with a constrained vision of cost and how we might be able to increase access to these drugs. So uh, that's what we've done most recently. But um, uh, Moji, I, I really appreciated your comment about in-country manufacturing because that's the other thing that we're doing right now is we're working with the folks in South Africa to uh, transfer one of our HIV drugs over there, and I think it's going to be the first HIV drug produced on the African continent. So this is going to be a real milestone for us, and we hope to do more of that. But lastly, I'll, I'll just comment why this is important, because one of the things that uh, the caveats that the Gates Foundation gave us when we started doing this was everything that we developed had to be open access with no IP uh, constraints. And we, we felt that that was the right thing to do. But when you think about what we're doing, is when we, when we look at a drug target, we do benchmarking. And what we'll do is we'll do a financial analysis of what the current process is and what uh, the cost drivers are. And then we'll focus on those cost drivers as a way of driving down the cost. Then we share that information. And you think about it from the standpoint of USAID or, or uh, Unitaid or the South African government. If they have that information in hand, then they're much more knowledgeable about how they can purchase drugs more effectively in, vo in high volume. So this then becomes another uh, added value that comes out of this activity. So Dan, thanks again for the opportunity to work with you on this. Yeah, great. Thank thanks, thanks, Frank. Yeah, the, so some of the reductions are, are really impressive. And you know, our return on investment has been in the hundreds of millions of dollars. So for the same amount of money, we can purchase just folds more product to get into uh, especially low-income countries. And, and it was also satisfying to see even the U.S. government starting knocking on your door about some of these other things and other private institutions as well. Um, so I think that the approach that, that you and your colleagues have come up with is not just going to benefit um, people in low-income countries, but people in all countries which uh, your, your name, Medicines for All, is actually uh, coming true. So th thanks, thanks for your efforts in, in that area. And can I ask a follow-up question? Um, how much is the manufacturing cost? Because you always hear the prescription drug price is determined by all sorts of things, but how much is the manufacturing cost really playing a role in access in certain countries to the medications? Well, Kathy, I think that's kind of how we got into the situation we're in right now. Because um, in the U.S., I think it's probably manufacturing cost was like about a third, something like that. Not too much. In, yeah, in, in India and China, it's like 20 percent, 10 percent. So, so there was a, a big cost driver in moving of. Uh, uh, moving these activities offshore because labor costs were high. Oh, now, see. when you start thinking about innovation and automation, uh, the, uh, if you can do these things continuously with uh, a lot of automation and a lot of uh, sensor technology to control product quality, now you have a situation where you can be, it doesn't matter where you are, you can produce these, these drugs in places where you're, you're independent of what the current labor costs are. Okay, so you can produce them lower, but then the price of the prescription drug over there now will go down, respectively. It should go down. Hopefully. Okay. Well, the, the, the interesting thing is the last part that I mentioned becomes important because if we give, uh, you know, we open up our, our books to folks like Unitaid and USAID about what our true costs are, they become much more effective purchasers. 
So that, uh, it's a combination of all of those things that I think are gonna add value. But the other thing I will add uh, that um, I think uh, uh, Rob talked about earlier today is one of the key elements of what we've been looking at is this whole supply chain. I mean, uh, it, when we got call, uh, called by the federal government to look at this reonshoring activity, uh, they asked me, so what do we need to do? And I said, well, it's not just the formulated product. It's not just the active ingredients. It's the starting it's the materials. materials. So yeah. we have to figure out how to, how to, how to uh, identify and effectively produce those key building blocks that make I those see. drugs. I see. Very interesting. Am I up now? Yeah. Okay. Final question, and we'll take other questions. And how are we doing on time? Pretty good. Okay, so this is a final question. So we're back to, we earlier heard about... Um, clinical trials. And we heard about diversity in clinical trials. Laura's panel particularly touched on that. So we want to ask for the same kind of question about how we can optimize clinical trials to make them informative for all populations, especially those in low and middle income countries. Are there things we can be doing differently? So I'm going to ask Dan to provide somewhat of an overview first, and then I'll go to the other panelists. Yeah. Great. Thank, thanks, Kathy. Um, yeah, I was pleased to, to see the emphasis on clinical trials by some of the earlier sessions. Um, and it's been an interest of mine for two decades. Um, <clears throat> I, think, I think recognition that clinical trials are generally poorly designed needs to be more well known. So there was a publication in JAMA, and I put the link into the chat by Deborah Zarin. Uh, talking about harms from uninformative clinical trials. And, and I read that and I looked at some of the cluster randomized studies that were being conducted at the Gates Foundation, found that two-thirds by design uh, were essentially failed from the start. Um, recently, Zarin and her colleagues also published a follow-up where they looked at the number of studies that meeting their definitions of informativeness was only 24%. Uh, industry topped out at 50%, which I wouldn't say that that's spectacular. Academics came in at the bottom with 6%, right? So, so if you we don't have any money. Get, get nothing else from, from our talk today, this is a real problem. Um, so, um, you know, what did we do about it? So we actually, you know, armed with this data, and in, in my uh, interest in this, um, we started to look at clinical trials, and we've looked at over 100 clinical trials that the Gates Foundation's published. We've set up a process called Design, Analyze, Communicate to address some of these issues, uh, which, um, again, there's a link in the, the chat section that will take you to publicly available information around the tools and the process that we use. There's also a free clinical trial simulator software there. Um, so uh, again, I, th these used to be very expensive. We've created this open source, just like some of the work that Frank's talked about. Um, and in there, there's actually a, a tool called the Design, Analyze, Communicate Assessment Tool, which is a list of, I think it's about 50-ish questions, ranging from general questions like, why are you doing the study? Uh, who's, who's going to care? What phase are you in? Um, and then it goes into different things about design. You know, what are your endpoints? You know, who's your population? We've got uh, specific questions about gender, so it was nice to, to hear that come up in an early earlier uh, area, and then also, uh, Ricky talked about uh, getting out into the populations that you're interested in, which I think is part of the communication aspect of it. And so, so you need to be out there talking to the populations that you want to be enrolled in these clinical trials. So, um, there's a lot of work there. Um, you know, plagiarism. Plagiarism is a, is a great form of flattery. Uh, pleased to have many people starting to plagiarize our approach here. Uh, Professor Moji and the, the NAVDEC uh, agency have, have done this. WHO is looking at this. Uh, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovations, or CEPI, is adopting this. And, and several other, other areas uh, 
and institutions are as well. Um, and I'll just conclude with that no matter how good your processes are, you need the right people. And this really is a team effort. In my experience where I see this start to go south is when you have a dominant component of the team, whether it's the clinician, the statistician, the pharmacologist, people involved in operations. It really does require an equal team effort. Everybody's voice needs to be heard. And when that happens, uh, hopefully we can move above the 24% that we're currently at. I like that very much. Okay, let's go to our panelists, so except mine is Frank. Um, so, okay, let me start with Peter. Yeah, so, um, whoops. Yeah. yeah right. um, you, 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 you know, um, th this is one, again, where I, I think, you know, we, we have a, a lot that we can do um, uh, in, in terms of, of trying to improve uh, at, at the, the, the clinical trial process, I think one of the things we can do in, at, at least in uh, high income countries is if we were to uh, allow more generalizability from some of our clinical trials, it might be helpful. Um, uh, and uh, I, I think that goes to uh, something we learned something of during the pandemic, which was kind of more pragmatism, more community-based trials, more diversity in the trials that we enroll in the United States um, uh, as a good example of what could be done globally. Because I think the, the, uh, the ability to have broadly applicable clinical trials is limited by the fact that oftentimes um, we do um, enroll very select populations um, that are selected uh, sometimes unintentionally uh, by using academic medical centers, by not using community sites, um, uh, and, and by making things less accessible um, uh, for underserved communities. So I think that's, that's one of the things I can I could imagine we could do uh, to uh, help us uh, here. Over. Okay, great. Um, okay, I'll go to Jocks, since I missed him the first time. Um, I hope you can hear me. Yes. I was on mute. The, um, I think this question can be addressed with the, um, the other question of equity and diversity in clinical trials because it has an impact at different levels, whether it's uh, study design, whether it's, it's different methodology. There was a discussion earlier on real-world data. I think that this is another way to integrate uh, more countries into uh, clinical uh, data collection. I think the other aspect of looking into broader population, ethnicities, minorities, is important with the use of early diagnostic and screening and the use of precision medicine. I also think about uh, expanding the locations of clinical trials. They are very often uh, very defined in certain countries. There is a possibility uh, to expand the locations. I think there will still be an issue of access to treatment, not all treatment, and I'm thinking about standard of care, as I mentioned before, may not be available in all countries. So that's another issue to, to think about. The, the other element uh, that I feel is also uh, important, there is, there is a paradigm change here. And obviously, uh, I think that Dan mentioned these educational efforts uh, across all stakeholders will also be important. Thank you, Jacques. Um, okay, let's see, I've got Moji. Professor Moji, next. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Kathy. Um, it's very interesting that we're talking about informativeness uh, and clinical trial. Uh, we've been fortunate to be funded by uh, the Gates Foundation uh, in terms of uh, using DAC. Uh, design assessment and community approach uh, to develop uh, a clinical trial database or platform. Uh, why is informativeness so important? It is important because it has to be subject driven, excuse me, uh, yeah, subject centric, because if we do not consider the subject uh, when we are designing uh, or even during the course of a uh, 
at the study, then very likely the 24% success that uh, Dan is talking about uh, will be the case. And we have to move on or move, or move past that. Uh, we started uh, the DAC, or we started using the DAC system uh, 20, I believe 2019, just before the pandemic. And uh, we have our own electronic clinical application uh, platform, ECTAP, uh, in our, on our website. And uh, for research funders and investigators, uh, using the informative approach mitigates risks. Uh, it's hypothesis driven. Uh, it increases likelihood of moving an intervention to a cure. Uh, it also increases community trust. I had a clinical trial that was FDA approved in 2010 while I was still a professor in the US and uh, the clinical site was Nigeria. I had to meet with the uh, local community leaders, uh, the church leaders, the imams, the transport unions, uh, to bring them in to make sure that there's confidence in them, uh, that, that is built in them. Uh, so that community involvement helped, and we were quite successful in that particular clinical uh, trial that led to us getting an IND. Uh, Wow, approval from the U.S. Moji, thank you very much for that because I think it was really emphasized earlier. We heard it in Laura's panel about bringing the community in and engaging the community from the get-go. I have Emer for, I think you're the final person here. Um, uh, yeah, Kathy, thank you very much. And I have to say I really agree with uh, what Dan, in fact, what everybody has been saying because optimizing clinical trials is a huge tra challenge and a huge conundrum. And we see a huge waste of resources on clinical trials. And if you look at what happened during COVID, uh, FDA did excellent work in mapping and analyzing the uh, redundant clinical trials. And over 95% of them were non-actionable for regulatory purposes. Um, and we tried to look at, well, why was this happening? Um, and uh, uh, ICMA actually published a statement at, which was addressed to all stakeholders, to patients, to investigators, to researchers, to academia and the pharmaceutical industry, stressing the importance of ro robust evidence from uh, randomized clinical trials. Um, and also uh, stressing that uh, to, the need to focus on, on certain characteristics um, uh, would, such as robust design, high capacity sites, solid pharmacological uh, rationale, and all, if we get people to focus on these, we will, we will definitely get better trials. Uh, but of course, this isn't just an, an uh, LMIC problem. This is also a problem across across the world. And we we uh, in in Europe, we're trying to to address this through the um, ACT EU initiative, accelerating clinical trials in the EU. And what we're trying to do is uh, part of this is about bringing together a multi-stakeholder platform for topics of mutual interest to develop better clinical trials. Um, so it's not just about making it simpler to perform trials, it's making sure that the trials performed are useful, efficient, and that they answer the right question. Um, but if you, I, I need to come back to, to what I said in the beginning, the ambitions have to be shared across the wider ecosystem. It's not just the regulators. We need academics, we need non-commercial sponsors, research funders, donors, even the scientific journals to understand the challenges and to be part of the solution. And this is why I think the multi-stakeholder platform is so important because if we only do it in one area, we're not going to, we're not going to get the benefits um, uh, that, that we need across all, all our stakeholders. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Ema. Yeah, great. I, you know, I think that's a, it's an excellent point, Emer, that it does require multiple stakeholders. So if you think about the 6% of academic studies that were actually informative, 100% of those were approved by IRBs and ethics committees. So, so there's, there's a pretty dramatic uh, 
contrast there. So I think I think we've certainly got some some progress to make. Kathy, back to you. Dave. Okay, we have just a couple of minutes. I want to take a few questions, and anyone in the audience who wants to ask a question. But let me say this one is looks like it could be for Frank. How do you preserve the GMP standards when manufacturing is moved to offshore countries? Oh, that's a great. Uh, concerned that we have too, Kathy. So one of the things we're working on is a model right now where, uh, in, in fact, we're working on this on the formulation side, where the actual drug gets uh, developed, produced, manufactured, and approved by the FDA over here. And then we do a site transfer. And then that way you're, you're, you're uh, uh, using the best GMP capabilities that, that we can and uh, then it becomes kind of a seamless operation rather than having to reinvent the process at the other end um, and have them develop their own technology. Why don't we just leverage that capability that we already have here and use those standards? Okay, yeah. right. And, and I, th I think another aspect of that is, you know, if we move these quote unquote offshore, those offshore places actually have regulatory agencies overseeing that work, exactly. right? So it's, uh, you know, I think that's why strengthening the regulatory, the global regulatory system is so important. Okay, great. I think we'll adjourn the panel. Everybody is ready for lunch here. I really want to thank our panelists um, for this interesting discussion. This is our first discussion of global regulatory science, hopefully first of many. So thank everybody. Thank you.